Recon Cast, Episode 6. Hello everyone, welcome to Recon Cast, just a couple of homeschool dads talking about recovering the faith for all of life. I am Joe Graham, homeschool father of eight. Joining me is my co-host, Dan Stahosky, homeschool father of five. We're out here in the beautiful Pacific Northwest, raising our families, defending liberty and justice against the overrun of humanism and the secular state. Today, we're going to catch up a bit for uh, for a little bit, and then we're going to uh, get into an interview that Reconstruction Life did with Curtis Bowers. He's the producer of the award-winning documentary Agenda, Grinding America Down, and the producer of the most recent sequel, Agenda 2, Masters of Deceit. Oh, and guess what? He's also a homeschool father. You're going to love to hear about this interview where we asked Mr. Bowers about his project and also how he was able to incorporate his family into his domain task. It's going to be great. So without further ado, Dan, how you doing? Hey, hey, Joe. I'm doing pretty well. Thank you. It's great to be with you today. Yeah, it's good uh, for us to get a chance to get together again. How you guys been? We have been uh, very good. Very good. You know, it's middle of summer right now as we're recording this, and it has been a beautiful summer. Lots I know, of it's sunshine. Been really nice out here too. Uh, yeah, the last few summers have been really good. You know, out here in the Northwest, sometimes you can get pretty rainy uh, summers, but I'll just say this: uh, the last few have been uh, really above average. So uh, we are we're doing really good. The kids are enjoying it. When I'm off at work, sometimes the the mom takes the kids off to the to the local the local lake and uh they get to play swim and whatnot so it's a lot of fun yeah yeah well, how doing, about you uh, we're doing the same kind of stuff families out uh, enjoying the sunshine uh, i'm sure that our that our fan uh the fan that's his the name fan. Now, right? the fan I like the fan i'm sure the yeah. fan is out there he's uh, enjoying time with his family as well so it's a great season for it to get out there and just uh, do stuff with the family. So, uh, what kind of stuff you guys been up to? Well, you know, we actually just got back from a little vacation. We were gone for just over a week uh, to a family lake cabin up on the other side of the the state. Uh, first few days there, beautiful, above ninety degrees, sunny, hot, wasn't too much wind, so we were able to do a lot of fishing out there. Uh, this this cabin it's a it's an older cabin big log cabin so it's really fun uh kids love it there's a lot to do out there and i got to actually teach the kids how to fish so oh, nice. uh, that was a lot of fun they they loved it they loved it is that yeah. the first time you guys uh went fishing uh the first time i've taken the kids fishing yep and oh, nice. it was it was a lot of fun they were just so into it I think there's really something we don't think about too often, but as dads, when you're excited about something, your your kids are going to get excited about it, and it it makes it actually a lot more fun to do it all together. So, so what was it that, that you were super excited about that you were just uh, that you were casting lines, or that you were just prepping uh, baiting hooks, or uh, what part? You know, um, I think it was fun watching them just hold the hold the rod and with the anticipation of, Oh, I'm going to catch a fish. I'm going to catch a fish. So at one point we had four, uh, rods going at the same time. And, uh, we That's did a actually lot. catch a, Yeah, it was, it was great. Uh, we caught some fish, so they got to reel in a few and you know, nice. the kids don't need licenses. So you can extend your, your, if you held your hands out, would it be like really, really big, right? Like, Oh, I mean, I don't know if I can stretch quite that, Bar. but yeah i mean it it was just like I mean, big <laughs> oh yeah biggest lake trout uh a lot of yeah at least at least two pounds i think <laughs> maybe maybe more um but i got really good at untying knots in fact uh you know i kind of had a one of those like just moments where you're saying i think the lord is using this as an analogy for me right now what what in my life is a knot i have to un- untangle but uh are you trying it was to bring, good. trying to bring the spiritual relevance there into your uh into your kids tangling up fishing lines? Yeah. Yeah. I mean yeah, I Am mean I re- you try, whatever you can. I mean draw the lessons out, you know, like that that's what you're trying to do. I, I'm always trying to bring it back, right? I'm I mean it's just <laughs> extremely spiritual. 
about that. It's all, you know, there's always, a, there's always a picture. <laughs> yeah. So long as you're not cutting the line, you know, I mean, yes, there's a story there too. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, the, <laughs> know the, the, <laughs> well, sometimes you have to cut the line. Sometimes, sometimes you have to just cut your losses. Say. You know, yeah. sometimes your sister's pole is going to mess your pole up and she's going to make a knot and you're going to have to cut her off. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I just want you to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> or, something, or something like that. <laughs> I don't know what my five year old will really grab what she'll do with that, but yeah, it's a good it's a life lesson. I mean, we, you gotta learn at some point. How are they, uh, they gonna learn these? <laughs> <laughs> it's our job. It's our job as extreme dads. Sweet, sweet. Uh awesome. Yeah, we Yeah, what we have you been actually, up to? We actually got a little bit of stuff uh done this weekend, uh this past weekend as well. We Went down uh, down to the camp, which is down here on the uh, south end of the island. Went out to Lakeside Bible Camp. Uh, we have some friends that are out there. Uh, and, you know, it's kind of super family-friendly. Uh, it's got tons of activities that you can do that you can get involved in. It's on the lake, so there's a lot of boating and floating and splishing and splashing and, and stuff like that. Uh, we also did some biking. They have a BMX course that they have there as well. Uh, frisbee golfing. We ate uh, dinner together. So it was super, super exciting uh, for the kids because they just amazing. were eating it up. You know, we had a, a campfire and stuff. It was just, it was almost just like, uh, you know, happy overload is what it seemed like. So, uh, but we had a great time. It was, uh, I would say it was definitely very extreme. Uh, so us <laughs> going out there and having a great time uh, together. So it was pretty, uh, it was pretty fun. Uh, that's what we ended up doing a little while ago. So we put, uh, we put our, cool. our, one of our videos up there for, uh, for Extreme Dad, uh, up online, uh, that you can check out, uh, as well. Wait, time out. Wait, what, what did you say? What's Extreme Dad? Extreme Dad? You don't know what Extreme yeah, Dad is? Yeah, what is that? It sounded like that was a thing. And here I thought it was a, you know, a person, but it sounded like you just said, you posted something online for Extreme Dad, and I think our fan will want to know about that. All right. This is for our fan. All right. Fan, as I'm sure you're knowing this, uh, as I'm sure you know this, that being a dad is always extreme. Now, that's what Extreme Dad is. Now, what does that mean? What that means is that what dads are constantly called to do is to take care of their families, love their wives, uh, and teach and raise up their children. And when we're doing that, when we're engaged in that process, whether it's untangling knots or whether it's boating around on a lake with our kids, we are being extreme when we're raising up that uh, that next generation and we're teaching them about what family life looks like. Uh, and this is how we are going to reconstruct society, uh, one heart and mind at a time. So it's uh, this is a this is a collaboration tool. Uh, this extreme dad that we're talking about here now just. Encouraging fathers, encouraging families to realize that all of these little uh, minor things that seem insignificant in their life really carry a huge impact uh, on their family and on the society in general. So that's uh, that's a little bit of background behind uh, being an extreme dad. So I want to uh, encourage people to uh, help collaborate with us, share, talk about things that they're doing that are extreme so that we can just uh, continue to have a discussion here uh, and encourage other people, other families to know that, hey, that's what you're doing. It's important. It makes a difference. Uh, and I want you guys to, to go ahead and to see that, understand that, and be encouraged to uh, to, to be extreme. Be an extreme dad. That is awesome. I love this idea. I love this idea. So, okay, I want to run an example past you and see if it qualifies as extreme dad. Yeah. Because when I hear of extreme dad, I'm thinking, okay, you're taking your kids, like, like kite surfing or something. But I, I don't think that's what you what you mean. Um. So, no, okay. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah, go so ahead. the what other, yeah. So uh, it actually happened just, just a little bit ago. Um, it was, you know, kids were in bed. I put them down. Uh, my wife helped me. We, we put them down together. And then, you know, after you put your kids down, it's kind of break time to get onto the planning. We have a big trip coming up, uh, kind of an extended, uh, time away. And so we're, we're busy planning for that. And, uh, in the middle of that, you know, you're finally, it's quiet. You're finally getting stuff done. One of my daughters walks in and she says, dad, you have to save me. And I, uh, yes, I do. What's, what's going on? She says, dad, there's a big 
big stingy bee in my room. And I, <laughs> oh, oh no, we, we got to take care of this right away. So if I had my GoPro, this I think is the moment where I, where I put that on. And I'm now would be recording live because I'm going to be sending this into extreme data reconstruction life.com to set, to get it posted. But we are going up the stairs and another daughter comes out of the room and says, dad, we are not joking. This is for real. There is a bee above Mary's bed. It's for real. It's not a joke. So, okay, good. Okay. So they kind of know the difference between truth and, and, and error. So that's good. So, um, (laughs) But I walk in there, and here's this bee. It is on the wall, and it is not a bee. It's a fly. <laughs> but it didn't matter. They were they were all terrified. So I go in out. I got something to swat it with. I killed it. I it landed on the ground. I picked it up. So I killed it. They are like celebrating. I'm I'm the you know I'm the hero. And then uh, uh, I'm actually then I give them a little biology lesson. Right? I'm like, okay, come now. Look at what you were afraid of. Let's let's dissect this a little bit. There's the wings, there's the eyes, and uh, I show it to my son. He goes, "Dad, that's so awesome." You know. So, uh, okay. Quick question: Does that qualify as extreme, Dad? Uh, well, I think the fact that you are saving your uh, your daughters from this uh, big bad fly, and it, and something that n- not necessarily that you think is a major threat to them, but but they are convinced in their mind that they need someone to rescue them. Well, who mm-hmm. else is going to come and rescue them? But but an extreme dad. <laughs> yeah, so, that's right. So I think yeah, that yeah. that absolutely uh, qualifies uh, as part of uh, what it means to be an extreme dad. Uh, defending your daughters against the big bad fly. Uh, absolutely. Now I would say that you went above and beyond what a what a basically like an average extreme dad like me would do uh, by turning it into a biology lesson. Uh, also for for your kids, but that's just like the the advanced homeschooling tactics that you're using, uh, I suppose. Yeah, it really is. It's in the advanced uh, handbook for homeschooling. Like an AP it says, level. Yeah, it's a, it's AP level. <laughs> uh, always, always be teaching at all times, uh, <laughs> even even at eleven o'clock at night. There's always an opportunity to capture those kids' hearts. Uh, no, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, you know, yeah, no, I definitely think if you would have had if you would have had some footage uh, and you mm. could have got that on YouTube, we easily could have put that on the Extreme Dad playlist, uh, and we probably would have gone viral with it. That that That's was the I'm moment. Thinking. Gosh, that was my opportunity to think. go viral. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, next so, yeah. time, okay, I gotta catch. I gotta get my video going next time. Maybe I'll just grab my phone. Yeah, so, Dan, so get, that, your, get your cameras, <laughs> get your cameras, and get yourself uh, videoing. Doing extreme stuff, you know. I want to see see someone teaching their kids how to ride a bike. That's extreme. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. That, Let's do that's it. That's awesome. We'll see. Or how about how about, how about just leading your family, leading your family in prayer or like in family worship or something? I mean, that's extreme. Yeah. Or coming home, extreme, giving worship. your kids a hug, hug and kiss before you have dinner. That's extreme. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, that is too. Yeah. Yep. So we get those uh, those videos up there, and then we'll uh, and then we'll share them. Uh, out there on the playlist so other people can see. So Love it. I love this idea. That's great. Good deal. Uh, all right. So, uh, yeah, so I think that, uh, that, that covers us, the uh, catching up. Now it's time for us to go to our, uh, our first, uh, first piece here. Uh, let's see. What we got up next is Worst Week's Excuses. Mm, mm. I love this segment. Are you ready? Are you ready? Oh, yeah. I got a doozy. Yep. <laughs> I got a doozy for you, Dan. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, why don't you go first, Joe? Give let's hear it. <laughs> all right, all right. So, uh so in here in our home and our and our family, uh we do occasionally run into some excuses. Uh so recently, uh we've been trying to work on getting the family to help out getting their chores done. Well, one of the big chores and I say this is a mega one for like the the more responsible uh children, the, the older ones, um is to be able to make dinner, to make food, to make lunch, make breakfast or whatever. And I want the children to be engaged in learning about how to be making meals and how to be prepared so that they don't just, you know, when they're done and they're leaving the house, they're not just like at a loss for how to do it. Sure. So, uh, so we do have one of my children is responsible uh, for making dinner this one day. And so my wife, uh, you know, talks to her and I think they're actually, uh, texting, uh, over the computer because they're doing, uh, 
schooling with the computers and stuff. So we kind of using the iMessage uh, going there. So she iMessages her. Did you make dinner? I think maybe mm. she was at the car or something like that. She was out in town. And she gets a text back. It says, there's a cat sleeping on my lap. <laughs> well, I instantly understand this. I, I get this. I understand this, right? You know, well, of course you can't make dinner because you have a cat sleeping on your lap, right? It, yeah, that is extremely logical. I mean, that cat, it has to finish its nap. Yeah. You know, right? I mean, the people, I mean, I don't even, it doesn't even matter what time dinner is supposed to be at at this point when, you know, there, there's a cat there. No, it you know. all slows down and stops and waits for that cat. When that cat is getting ready to get up off the lap, then, then dinner we can, will be made. Oh, it'll be made. Yeah, and it will be. I mean, that that was the entire plan, I'm sure. With gusto. I, yeah, with gusto. Uh, that is that is a wonderful excuse. Um, no, and I no, I just, no. I, that I just, is the worst excuse that I've oh, heard that this worst, week. Oh yes, That's that the is the worst, worst excuse. I, this is not the good excuses segment. This is the worst excuses <laughs> segment. <laughs> It is a terrible excuse. Uh, cats will sleep anywhere. Just FYI, pro tip. That's right. That cat, you can pick that cat up, put it down on a rock, and it will still take a nap. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, that's great. Well, uh, we won't go into what the response on the iMessage was, but I, I think it was, uh, go cook dinner now, please. Okay. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> that's nice. Fake food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so my worst week excuse. Uh, we get a lot of excuses too, but some of them are are more um, in the complaining vein. So, but the the one I I want to share was uh, from my three year old son. The uh, mom is getting everybody in the car. They have errands to run, and I don't know if they were running late per se, but they needed to get in the car and it was time. And here, you know, and so she says, uh, son, Joshua, it's time. It's time to go. He says, yeah, mommy, I'll be right there. First, I have to swing like a monkey. <laughs> I'm just, and, you know, they, the I'm reasoning that behind that, we understand the reasoning behind that. It's pretty obvious. Uh, I don't know. I, I think every family practices swinging like monkeys, so it was just his opportunity, his time to do that, I'm sure. Uh, but no, that was a pretty bad excuse. Was it on the Turn- schedule, though? Monkey swinging? No. No. Oh, no, man. See, no, that would have been his out right there. That would have been his out. I know. Like, well, we had pre planned this, and yeah. I need to swing like a monkey right now. Yeah, like a monkey. I mean, but no, it was not on the list. It wasn't scheduled. It was not even discussed. Yeah. Actually, it was uh, uh, it was an excuse for why he was not getting in the car. So, uh, pretty yeah. bad. Sadly, because he's three, it was kind of cute too. But it was still uh, those are the worst. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> those cute excuses. You know, like uh, uh, my wife will do that when. Some kid gives you a terrible uh, excuse, or they're disobedient, or something. But they just look so cute. You're like, oh my goodness! <laughs> you yeah, you don't just don't want to say or don't want to do anything. Uh, so yeah, but but I'll still say something. But we now okay. Yeah, catch my breath. I'll laugh about this later with my spouse. Right now, this is what you have to do. That's right. That's extreme dad right there. Let's get that out. It is. <laughs> and extreme mom, okay? Yeah. How can an extreme, extre- a non-extreme mom would have stopped and said, "Oh, son, you're so cute. You go <laughs> swing like a monkey, and you come to the van whenever you want to." No, that's a non-extreme mom. Yeah, that's not. That's not good. <laughs> <So>. <clears throat> okay. uh, all right. Awesome. Great. So, uh, yeah. So the uh, so the next uh, next thing we got out. Speaking of uh, of moms and dads, uh, I had an interesting question that came up here um in my house this past week uh so <clears throat> so kind of interesting theological question uh you know maybe we can discuss this a little bit what you thought so one of my uh younger daughters uh she she's been listening to a lot of bible stories uh the lamp ladder old testament new testament bible stories they're really mm-hmm. really good i really enjoy it, uh, them a lot and the girls the girls just love them so they listen to them when they go to sleep but they're getting saturated with a lot of good uh 
good information. But this question came to me recently, uh, and it's and it was it was a kind of a two part. It was like a you know two part. Uh, said, "Daddy, can brothers and sisters marry?" And I was like, "Well, well." And she's like, "Because back when it was Adam and Eve, they had mm. to marry each other." And yep. I was like, "Oh yep. man, this, yep. this kid is a dynamo." <laughs> Yeah. This, kid is, yeah, this kid's a dynamo already. Um, so I'm like, yeah, yes, honey. <laughs> uh, Adam and Eve in their time, yes, they they could marry brothers, could marry their sisters because they uh, because God said it was still going to be okay uh, for them. But now for us, uh, we can't do that anymore because uh, God changed it after uh, many, 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 many generations had passed, um, and God gave the formalizing of the law, so now that doesn't occur anymore. <clears throat> so we yeah. can't do that anymore. But she was like, she was ready. She <laughs> she wanted to try to understand it right away because I don't know. Maybe she, I think she really likes her brothers and her sisters. <laughs> but I mean, uh, kind yeah. of a tough, <laughs> a tough one uh, to help her understand uh, a little bit. It's pretty deep. That it is really deep. But hey, great job. Just bringing the biblical references back out and answering the question from, from the Bible. That's yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. So That's good. they're being astute. So yeah. Yeah. Did you guys, did you guys have any, uh, any interesting the- theology that came up this week? Yeah, we, uh, we did. So, um, one of my, my daughters who, uh, was, you know, uh, thinking that the fly was a bee earlier, she also, but she's also actually quite turned on. And she uh, asked me, said, Dad, if God, uh, if God has always existed, who, how did he get created? So it was just that classic question of, you know, where did God come from? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> it was good. Good. Well, uh, God is is uh, has is always existing. He is God um, and self-existent. Yeah, there are some things that we can't quite wrap our heads around uh, in, with where we're at. We see through a glass dimly, um, and uh, but we go, we live by faith, and we live by faith on the Word of God. And the Word says that He He is, or He you know He's always has been. And uh, that's what we could put our faith on. So I kind of turned it around into a faith question. Yeah. Um, but it was, uh, yeah, that wouldn't stop me a little bit just because I haven't actually thought deeply about that question since yeah. I was probably about five or seven. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> maybe maybe later than that, too. I don't know. But uh, definitely it's a great, great question. So, yeah, yeah kid theology. Yeah, that's a that's a deep one. So. Definitely, when our kids ask us questions, is a great opportunity. Great opportunity for an extreme dad to just step up and be like, yeah. "Hey, honey, yeah. you know, let me uh, let me talk to you. Let me tell you about what's going on." You know, um, and sometimes it can be something simple. And you know, I don't I don't know about for you, but sometimes for us, we just learn about things that maybe we need to anchor on a little bit. Kind of bring into uh, you know a dinner discussion or uh, bring into a worship discussion or something like that you know so uh, that we'll do that as well you know tips tips and techniques tips and techniques so no that's good I mean yeah some of those I'll be honest I I don't always answer them right the first time or as in depth as I need to so being free to go back and and follow up with that later on is a I think a really good piece of advice. Because yeah. uh, a lot of times you get that question, you're not really in the frame of mind or prepared for it, um, and you think about it later and say, "Oh, you know, this is probably the best way for a seven year old to think about that." Let me let me go talk to him again. So taking that time, that's extreme. Absolutely. Taking that time to, to go back and be intentional with with them. So yeah. Speaking of that, cool. uh, being intentional, we had mentioned on uh, one of our previous uh, podcasts that we were going to make uh, time to go and uh, and see. The showing of Agenda Two. Now I was able to uh, to go there. You have a, had a previous uh, engagement, so I had to go solo. But uh, the fan was there, 
uh, the fan oh, was showed he? up. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, there. <laughs> uh, yeah. He's he's asking me about what we're doing, how, how things are going. <laughs> so, I love uh, that. So, but uh, little uh, little did the fan know that that I had the opportunity to interview Curtis Bowers uh, there at the showing. I totally kind of just spur of the moment. Didn't know if I was going to get a chance to talk to him or not. I didn't pre-plan anything. I just was kind of like, I just showed up with a mic and some recorders. Uh, yeah. and so was well, you pre-planned that. That's good. Yeah. At least you came prepared just in case. I had anticipated <laughs> the opportunity uh, to go ahead and uh, to go ahead and interview him. So, uh, so yeah, we uh, maybe for for those of our listeners who don't know much about uh, Curtis Bowers or uh, his project working with Agenda, I think we got think we got a trailer uh, that we have queued up. Here's a trailer from you, can, and you can watch this trailer. Uh, Agenda Documentary dot com is their website, and that's a, this is uh, the trailer by the Copy Book Heading Productions. When yeah. I have the courage to say to our enemies, there is a price we will not pay. There is a point beyond which they must not advance. And this is the point I think Americans need to comprehend. If America goes down economically, it will go down militarily. If America goes down militarily, we all go down. The free world is finished, and will be finished for a very, very long time. There's a lot of things. Everything, practically, is, is in a self-destructive mode. We're in the most critical period we've been since the Revolutionary War. If you're not alert, you're not awake with like what's happening. They would just as soon see this country on its knees and everything equalized. That concept of collectivism, big government, is a magnet for the predator class. The plans for all this are to have everything globally in place by 2020. If we're that dumb and we allow this to happen, we deserve, we deserve everything we're going to get because we're going to get it right in the neck. We're headed into what could be a nightmare that would make all the atrocities of the 20th century look like they were a dress rehearsal. When people are afraid, they ask government to do more, not less. Their theories are designed to scare the people to believe there's a crisis when there is not a crisis at all. There's no crisis. I think we are losing more and more freedom because we are afraid. The left wants you to believe that catastrophe is always just around the corner. And the only way to avoid it is to do exactly what they say. But this film will show everything they do is just a Trojan horse of deceit, carefully crafted to advance their real agenda of finishing America off. We have been the main stumbling block to world communism since it first raised its ugly head. From the promotion of Islam to the propaganda of climate change. From the deceit of Common Core to the manufactured economic crisis, and from their manipulation of the evangelical church to the unsustainable debt burden. This film will show the issues are simply being used as a smokescreen to hide the purposeful, premeditated, treasonous attacks on the foundations of our freedom. The world religion has just purged us from being able to determine right from wrong. You know what Alexander Solzhenitsyn said about Russia? How the communists took over Russia? He said, we forgot God. It will expose the tactics and strategies our enemy is using to prey on the good nature and caring spirit of the American people. Their magnum opus of fraud and corruption is sustainability, the most clever on-ramp to totalitarian control ever devised. This film will show it has nothing to do with clean air, water, and stewarding our resources, things everyone is for. No, unfortunately, it is just a masterpiece of marketing being used to convince people that a one-world problem requires a one-world solution by a one-world government. Under the new Agenda 21 movement, we've been demoted 
we are now below the earth. And if we are less than the earth, then there is no tyranny against man that cannot be justified under the premise of protecting the environment. If you believe that there's nothing special about man, it can take you all sorts of places. Unless there is a change in this country, we are going to end up at the end of the line in a totalitarian state. Their stated agenda, carved in stone on a monument in Georgia and outlined in documents placed in the Ark of Hope, is to eliminate six and a half billion people by centuries end. And they will succeed if we don't stop them. This is not just a fight for the United States of America. This is a fight for civilization itself. It's everything Karl Marx dreamed of before our very eyes. I think they've pushed us over the cliff in every sense. America isn't going to fall. We are falling. There it is. Pretty good wow. teaser there, huh? Yeah. Full five minutes. It's good. Yeah, I think uh, it uh, still played pretty well there on the on the radio. There's a lot of great uh, video for the interviews and stuff that he did there uh, as well. So, yeah, he uh, he did a, a tremendous amount of research uh, for the second film. He gave a lot of the background and stuff for some of the concepts and stuff that he was exploring in his first movie. So, yeah, we went to the showing there for uh, for Agenda 2. Uh, and it was great. Really, really enjoyed it. We had a good time. So and they do a lot of these showings, don't they? And that's kind of one of the things they like to do, or one of the ways they promote it. Yeah, um, yeah. And the, one of the big, big that. things is that the, this uh, not only does Mr. Bowers, you know, have a have a passion for this idea, this concept. I mean, and kind of uh, exactly what uh, what we're doing and talking about here at Reconstruction Life. Uh, as well uh is about uh, rebuilding these the these broken pieces that we're finding around uh, our society and that's kind of what Curtis is uh, is talking about is how, what things are broken and he's kind of really uh zeroing in and nailing down a couple things that we can kind of focus on uh to see uh, and then also gives some good uh, action steps uh when he when he uh, does uh, present the video as well uh so <clears throat> not only is he doing that but hey guess what Curtis Powers homeschool dad how about that? So he's wow. So he's he's uh he's doing it all. I mean he's he uh he's he kind of is is got a family business now. He's doing homeschooling as a dad. He's got you know people he's now connecting with. I mean he interviewed folks like Alan Keyes, Star Parker, uh, other folks uh, for this documentary. I mean he's been busy. Yeah, uh, we you could say that he is certainly an extreme dad. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> absolutely i Definitely. love that well um the uh you know a lot of the the content in that documentary can be overwhelming but he ends with a lot of hope at the end of it that's probably one of the, the things i remember from watching it and that i really appreciated was yeah he uncovers he unveils a lot of the deceit or a lot of the the, the inner workings that are happening but he ends with a, a, a lot of hope which is something we we believe in strongly on Reconstruction Life that uh, ultimately God wins, right? And this is all going according to his will. Um, and uh, But we are hopeful, hopeful about the future. It, it might it might appear like the storm clouds are, are, are forming or have formed, uh, but ultimately God cuts through it and he is the victor and, and he will, uh, his enemies will be, uh, his footstool, and That's it may right. it may be it may be soon it may be way down the road, but we know and we believe that is that is the truth and that will be uh, the reality. So we can live in that even in the midst of the storm. Yeah, absolutely. No, the uh, Amen. The Lord is putting all uh, his enemies under his feet. Uh, the last one, which will be death, uh, before he returns. So <clears throat> yeah, so we got uh, so for us, like you're like you're saying, we're talking about. You know, uh, we say, "Hey, we're just uh, we're just a couple of dads. There's nothing we can do." And that that is not that is not true. What is true is that you being a dad is extreme, and that's exactly the kind of stuff that God wants to use uh, to rebuild uh, the stuff that's been broken in our society. So that's what we need to be thinking about, uh, and that's how God is gonna is gonna is gonna turn all this stuff uh, around, and He's gonna make His gospel go forth. So He's just gonna use regular everyday people, buddy. 
just like you and me. That's right. So I uh, love that. Anyway, so we uh, so we got a chance and we did interview Mr. Bowers, and so we'll go ahead and play that for you. And uh, hope you guys enjoy. Uh, we learned a lot. Hope you guys learned some stuff uh, as well. Okay, so I'm here with uh, Curtis Bowers. He is the uh, creator of uh, Agenda and uh, Agenda Two as well. So, uh, sir, thank you so much for uh, for joining us. Oh, happy to be here. Great. So, uh, so what I'd like to just kind of ask you is uh, just a couple things with regard to how you got inspired uh, to film uh, Agenda, your first and second films. Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, just initially, uh, what was it that kind of uh, was the impetus for you to to get involved with that project? Well, we had come across a lot of interesting information about why America was heading the direction she was, and it was just so uh, enlightening and so mind-boggling that we just said, people, this needs to be a film, but we didn't know how to make a film, so we started, we prayed about it for about six months, and then when we realized, yes, that that this is something God wanted us to do, uh, then we started just studying cinematography and filmmaking and and as a homeschool project, and uh, and then really we're committed to it. it took us two years full time um, to finish the project, and and uh, we're grateful that we did. Sure. And so when you say we, uh, I'm assuming you mean you and uh, your wife and your children. Yes, everybody on the first film. Uh, some of the children were a little bit younger, so they would help in different. Uh, ways, you know, bringing us supplies, helping set up lights or, or things like that. Uh, and then on the second film, as they've gotten older, helping a lot more with the actual shooting of the film to uh, finding the right music to fit the different scenes to, oh, finding the B-roll shots and, and watching sections and giving uh, critiques of, oh, if we should change something or not. So, yeah, as, as they've gotten older, they've been a great blessing in that. Okay, that's great. Uh, so then, as far as your perspective as a dad is concerned, uh, what was that experience life like as far as uh, including your, your family in that project? I mean, the first thing I realized is how I'd been wasting them all the years before that. Always thinking, well, no, I'll go earn the money. I'll do my thing, and they can sit home and do whatever. And I realized, oh, what a, what a mistake, first of all, but how then clearly – God obviously intended whatever the Father is doing in the family to be a blessing to that sure. and to make him be able to do so much more than he's capable of by himself when they're helping him. And that's what I, as the film was going on and we were doing that, I realized I could not do this by myself. Yeah. If I wasn't allowing my family to help me, I wouldn't have done. I wouldn't have been able to do it. And so it would never have gotten done. And uh, so, yeah, I... I've been so grateful that God asked us to do something that I knew I wasn't capable of doing by myself. So it forced me to use my family. And in that process, I realized, obviously, that is the way he designed things to begin with. I had just not been doing that like I should. Sure. Uh, so then uh, when you finished your uh, your first film, uh, the public reception was uh, was pretty good. How did you how did you guys take it? It did. We, we didn't know what in the world we were going to do to get it out to the people. We were so excited to be done, but then we realized, wait a minute, how do you get this out to the people when you don't have the funds like is normally used to promote a film? And uh, we prayed about that. We, we knelt down and prayed the day we finished the film and said, God, uh, we're giving you our loaves and fishes. And we're asking you to feed the 5,000. And he did. It It just took off all over the country in a very short period of time. And it just kept going faster and more copies being sold for two and a half years. It just right. kept rolling. It never – I was expecting, oh, maybe three or four months it'll peak up and that's the end of it. And then you go on to the next thing. But it, God kept us busy full-time for three years, just distributing that, promoting it, traveling and having showings and speaking. So that was another neat aspect that came from that. Then we, as a family, with that first film, we traveled to 43 different states wow. having showings and things. So it opened up a whole other world there as well. So it was it was a great blessing. Wow. So, I mean, I know for me and my family, we we got exposed to the to the film and uh, we ended up buying uh, multiple copies so that we could use it to to share and uh, and give to other people uh, as well so uh, i'm curious though so you you got the public reception uh, how all that was received uh, how did uh, how did your family what was the impact you know internally in your home when when all that reception was coming back and you guys were getting accolades like how did that uh, affect your family dynamics uh it was very positive in our our case i mean it was they all just realized, wow, one family can make a difference 
if they're doing what God wants them to do. Yeah. And they also realize even the littlest, the four-year-olds and five-year-olds, as we would do all our own fulfillment every day, they were packing up boxes of DVDs and, mm-hmm. and my daughters were printing out the labels and putting them on and going to the post office. Some day, we have a 15 passenger van and some days we couldn't fit it in the van. We had to take two trips really? to the post office. <laughs> That's how many DVDs were going out. Wow. And so it would take us four hours a day just to pack. We'd just be, then that's 11 people engaged. Yeah. Uh, so it was just, it became a life of its own. We were, we had thought, oh, what are we going to do when it's done? And we were so busy, we didn't know what to do. We could barely keep up, um, which was a great blessing because then we realized even the littles are a vital part of this family. What they yeah. were doing to pack those things, that saved us hours of time as adults doing that if they wouldn't have been able to do it or willing to do that or, or we'd ask them to do that or whatever. So it was just neat. Everyone had a role in it, and they loved it. Great. That's the thing that That's I think great. most dads don't understand, too. When you pull the kids in and the wife and say, hey, this is our thing as a family. This is my thing. It's our thing, and I need your help. Right. And you can be helpful. And as they plug in and see they actually are being helpful – it, it kind of bonds the family in a different way because everyone's a producer then. It's right. not just people sitting there getting free meals and <laughs> room and board and stuff. Mm-hmm. It's they're part of this family, and you're unified on a common cause, whatever it is. You've got a restaurant or you've got a lawn mowing business. But it, the family's together focused on the same thing, and it builds tremendous mm-hmm. unity. Yeah. No, that's great. That sounds like such a huge blessing. So uh, what uh, what sort of – uh, advice would you have for for dads who are out here who are trying to, you know, reorient their uh, their career maybe and trying to get some some guidance and some uh, some wisdom? What uh, do you have any nuggets that you can share? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. This is a big burden of my heart for fathers to understand that most in most cases, if you have children at home. I think he wants to be pulling you home and he will allow that to happen. If it's the desire of your heart, I was in the restaurant business working 80 hours a week and God started to burn my heart. You need to go home. I didn't even know what I was going home to do, but I finally read someone walked in the restaurant to buy it and it wasn't for sale. And I just sensed in my heart, God is letting me out of this. And I did not know what I was going home to do. Um, but I knew God was wanting me to come home and, and then the film and a lot of things came from that. But Here's the thing. Sit down with your family. It's a fun event. Sit down at the table and brainstorm. Get a notepad out and let everyone contribute of different business things your family might be capable of doing. I mean, just let the little ones throw in. I mean, my little ones throw in. They want to have an alligator farm where people come out to throw live chickens to the alligators. And and I say, (laughs) good, we'll put that on the list. Maybe God will have us do that. (laughs) And so, but every week, we did that just for one hour. came up with 75 good ideas for businesses. Yeah. And, And then... As soon as we're done traveling with this film, we're going to stop and start praying about those, God, now what would you have us to do? So I think if you do that as a family and then you see where the talents lie in your family to to make one of those things a reality, and maybe maybe you fathers, you can't come home immediately. I know several men that kind of led the family in getting a little business going on the side. The wife and the kids started getting things going. Mm-hmm. One man I'm thinking of in particular, he he said, once we can get that home business producing half of what my salaried position is, I'm going to quit it and come home. And hopefully with my direction and my input in there too as well, we can kick it up where I'm getting the, making the same thing I was at this job. Um, and so get them going. Those the, Your young, even young teenagers and, and before, they are creative and they have talents that God has given them. And if you can utilize all of that into something the family can do, um, it's just amazing. And you can come home then. And we'll be working with them, which the greatest blessing of that is then you have plenty of time for discipleship and mentorship and and walking alongside them and and building strong relationships where all your kids end up being your very best friends, too. You're still the parents, but you're you're just – you enjoy them. Right. My kids – I love being around my kids. I would rather be around my kids than any of my male friends my age, even though I have some nice friends, but I would always rather be with my kids because they're just – the best because I've spent time with them where we have good relationships right? and, and the business at home allowed us to do that. Yeah. So, uh, so, so dads, you can do it. Absolutely. Is that, that's, that's, it idea. is, especially if you're praying, God, please direct me. I want to come home. Hopefully your heart would love to spend more time with your wife and children, not in laziness, but in productivity and in, in, in impacting their lives. It's a vapor. Those kids will be gone before you know it. Mm-hmm. And if you don't, 
make that time now, you're, you're going to miss out and you will regret it. When they're gone one day and you realize I didn't impact them like I should, I didn't mentor them and disciple them, and I didn't build the relationships with them that I could have, I, I, I just know that will be something that will be regretted. And why do something today that you'll regret tomorrow? Right. So do it, but do it, do it very thoughtfully and prayerfully, asking God to bless your ideas, bless the efforts to create something at home that can maybe pull you there to just u- utilize the incredible potential he has given you and your family. It's, it's unbelievable what one family, if they're all focused on the same thing, not all doing their own thing, what they can accomplish. Yeah, amen, absolutely. Uh, so I think it's, uh, it's interesting also to note that kind of the, the focus uh, of, your, of your films, your documentaries in particular, has been you know, the, how, how an agenda has been established uh, against Americanism in general, right? Um, and how we've been break, loot, that's been broken down, uh, in, and and kind of what you're what we're talking about, just sitting here talking about right here, is like the the number one way how we can kind of combat combat that. Yes, that is overrun. build strong families that you've spent the time with to teach and train a, a world, Christian worldview where they understand what's going on. And when you've spent so much time, you are the dominant influence in their life, not their friends or their teachers or their, all the other things that pull them away from you. And that's, that's how our country has been in collapse is because the families have fallen apart. Parents hardly have any influence on their children. And the statistics show us that. Our, our, it's best estimation, and I think Barna came out with this just about a year ago, the average Christian family loses 92% of their children after one semester in college. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's how that's, well we've trained them. One semester of college, they've already turned their back on God, on family, on everything that you were supposed to teach them, but obviously didn't because you didn't have the time because you were gone, because it's taking that little bit, three months of college, and they're they're done with they're done with Christianity, the Bible, truth, and it's unbelievable. Right. Yeah. So, so dads, moms, and dads, you have a a heart or or burden, and you sense kind of how the culture is uh, is going is going downhill or has been going downhill. And what we're saying is here, you know, we need to be penitent, <laughs> repent of the way that we have contributed to this problem, Absolutely. and how we've just kind of advocated our responsibilities and our influence that we have amongst the nation and. It's just, Specifically, the discipleship missionary activity that we have right in front of our faces every single day. Yes. I mean, if I always tell this when I'm talking in front of people. If all the people and families that would have voted for Ronald Reagan in 1980 when he had that huge upset, if just those people that voted for him would have passed down to their children the principles and the, the biblical principles and the truth – that they knew and they knew that had made America what it was at that point, we would have almost an 80% majority today. We could have a godly Christian man Mm. in every position of authority in America. Instead, we're slipping where we have 45% or less. It's slipping every year because they've taken our children and they keep taking our children. And so their numbers will just keep growing and growing. The anti-American, anti-God, and anti traditional biblical values crowd is just growing every year that goes by because there's more kids coming out of the system and going to their side. So 92% go to their side, 8% come to our side. Yeah, sure. Uh, so then you, uh, you guys have this, uh, this new project that, uh, that, you just are, uh, that you just finished and now you're uh, promoting. So can you tell us just a little bit about uh, your new documentary? Yes, it's just a, a film that, that is a sequel to the first one that gave the history of to how we've gotten to where we are in America. And this one goes into more of a lot of the issues that we are facing today and how they unfortunately um, do not have good intentions behind them. They they are simply tools being used uh, to kind of finish us off. And uh, it's, it's really sad. So we're just trying to wake people up to the reality of what has happened and what is happening currently. Okay. Uh, well, great. Well, really uh, excited, grateful, sir, Mr. Bowers. We're out here uh, for the showing. Uh, I have actually already seen uh, the video, so and I appreciate it. It was a, it was a blessing to me. Thank um, you. So, uh, so thank you so much uh, for your time. Do you have uh, a place where you can uh, recommend people to kind of get in contact with your material um, and with your documentaries? Absolutely. If you go to agendadocumentary.com, 
agenda documentary.com you can watch both trailers to the movies to see if it's something you might be interested in and then if you'd like you can order there and the more copies you get the cheaper it gets because we want to encourage people to use it as a tool to wake up other family and friends to what's happening in our country okay and uh and can people get in contact with you there if they want to have orchestrate their own showing as absolutely. well? absolutely yep there's a contact button on there and and we'd be happy to hear from you Okay, fantastic. All right, Mr. Bowers, thank you so much uh, for joining us here on Reconcast. Uh, looking forward to, uh, to watching this uh, video and, um, and helping you guys out. So, Appreciate it very much. Thanks so much. You guys have a good day. Bye. All right, so we're back uh, that, from, that, from that interview. Man, he's great. Super inspirational. I am blown away. What a what a great man! A lot of wisdom there. I uh, really really appreciated him uh, taking time uh, to meet with us. So again, you can go to agendadocumentary.com dot uh, com to visit uh, his website and uh, get in touch with his material. Uh, so the things that stood out uh, to you, Dan, from uh, from that interview. Yeah, there's a there's a few things there that I'm just gonna need to really grapple with and really take time to think through as a dad. And where my family is, I've got a, you know younger kids, but they aren't going to be young forever. And I've been saying that for for a while. Oh, I still have young kids. I still have young kids, but you know, I really need to start thinking through, um, like taking that seriously and really leave, taking it before the Lord. What what is uh the plan? His plan? How am I? How do I kind of re bring come home? Is that His will for me? Uh, I'm in a pretty uh, neat environment in my workplace. Uh, there's a lot of believers. It, there's a lot of faith that's ex- that's uh, discussed and talked about in the workplace. So it's it's different than I know a lot of friends who who live who work in places that are are not that way. Uh, so it's a little different, but at the same time, uh, to Curtis's point, um, you know this is. The strong families, rebuilding the families, is how we rebuild the nation. And I want—I really need to grapple with that, really think that through. Uh, you know, the one thing that he said that really spoke to me um, was when, uh, as dads, when we come home and we say, "Hey, we're going to do something together." When we make, when when dads can make it our thing like as a family, uh, it's not just my thing, but it's our thing. How that really bonds the family in a unique way. And that makes the children producers. Uh, those, those are the, that was really spoke to me because, uh, in some ways, I want to train my. I definitely want to train my children to be producers. I don't want them to be uh, just takers or or be uh, feel entitled or anything in that regard. I want them to be producers. Yeah. And if he's saying for his family, this is what they did, and this is what happened, is they became producers. There, then you know, I want to really seriously think about that. Yeah, no, I'm definitely with you on that. That's kind of a, one of the things that I uh, thought about as well. So not just the fact that you know that we're you know he's he's looking at and viewing the inputs and the value that his children are bringing to the project that he has. So maybe it's it's packing boxes, but he's you know he's seeing value and he's communicating value to them. And then as they're growing and maturing, you know, and that that value starts to uh, transcribe into different areas. They're yeah. still important. Uh, the older ones, just like the younger ones. So I thought it was great. I thought uh, I, I was pretty much on the same, uh, same line as you. I love the little crocodile uh, with the chicken stories. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah. That might not go over quite so well in my house since we do have a lot of chickens. Uh, we probably wouldn't yeah. want crocodiles uh, around here. <laughs> so it wouldn't go over. Uh, but I like the picture. Well, the funny part on that is that they were live chickens. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, yeah. this is not humane at all. There's no way that's going to fly. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I know. But, uh, but you know, like, you, you know what it's like when you're a dad and your kid just kind of says something that's off the wall and you're like, I'm not going to shut, I'm not going to shut this kid down. I'm going to be like, that's good. Let's go with it. We'll go with it. Yep. We're going to put it on the list. You know what? It's going on the list. Who else has got a great idea? You know, be like, uh, I think we should throw hippopotamuses out of airplanes. Boom, it's on the list. You just made the list. What else? <laughs> you know, it's just, uh, just, I mean, uh, and it, and for me, I think that's super valuable because it makes me think about uh, validating, uh, validating my children uh, and their inputs. You know, like I don't have to be yeah. so 
uh, critical about the things that they're saying, but can let them know that I want and appreciate their input and then just allow the Lord and the time to kind of just shape uh, the way some of that stuff is going to uh, mature uh, in the future, you know? So yeah, I thought it was great. You don't have to be too worried about uh, them actually growing up to have a live chicken alligator farm. Yeah, That's not going to happen, but we can support them. And it could go viral, you know, (laughs) it could go viral. (laughs) <laughs> uh in a probably a bad way so uh you know the other thing that he said that, that as a result of coming back into the family and doing these projects together you know they were focused on the same thing and that developed tremendous unity but i found it really interesting that he, he said that he would rather spend time with his children than with his male friends yeah like he just likes his like they're friends Yes, they're parents and children. They have that that relationship, but they are friends. And, and because they've done a hard thing together and they've done a big project together, you know, they prayed together a lot as well. I don't know if he spoke about that um, in when you guys were at the the show, but I know for the first uh, documentary, they they had a very uh, intentional schedule around their prayer and uh, even fasting. Uh, throughout yeah. the production of that, but they did it as a family, uh, right. and now they're they're a really close knit family. And which who of us as dads doesn't want to cultivate that type of family culture? Yeah, yeah. Let's get extreme here. <laughs> right. You yeah. Uh, we sure. we want to be friends. We do want to be. We want to have a friendship with our with our children. Uh, we mm-hmm. don't want to be the 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 domineering lord. Uh, we want to win their hearts. We want their hearts to be turned towards us. And I think one of the one of the keys there is if you're wrestling with this idea of of quitting your job and having a family business or doing a project as a family. I know, you know, it looks different maybe for for all of us, but doing projects as a family. Uh, I think that what what came to my mind as I was listening to the interview was um, the prayer in Malachi that. You know, the, the hearts of the fathers will be turned towards their sons and daughters, and the sons and daughters' hearts will be turned towards their fathers. Uh, I I kind of challenge us to, as fathers. We didn't start praying that prayer and see what see what the Lord puts on our hearts. What burden does he put there? And then are we going to be courageous to live into that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, <clears throat> yeah, there was a lot of value uh, value in there. And uh, I'm sure that if we if we get the opportunity to interview him again, uh, we'll just keep picking his brain. <laughs> so, I would love that. I think it'd be great to have him back on. Yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, so, so anyways, uh, that was uh, that was it, and uh, and that uh, that's all we have for uh, for everyone today. At Reconcast, uh, although we can uh, kind of talk a little bit about what's coming up here in the future. So uh, at the same event, we got the opportunity, Recon uh, Reconstruction Left did, to interview uh, Mr. Michael Bradrick. So he is a homeschool pioneer, and he's got a ton of sage guidance and wisdom, uh, Dan. And when that comes out uh, for the next uh, Reconcast that we do, man, I'm telling you, there's going to be so much that we can glean uh, from a pioneer like uh, like Mr. Bradrick. So that's uh that's coming I up though. There's a can't piece. wait. Yeah. So uh so everybody uh hope you get a chance uh, to stay tuned. I hope you enjoyed the show. Uh and tune in uh, with us next time we come back with a re- recon cast. Uh so thanks so much for joining us. Goodbye.